Let's turn to Mark's Gospel. And uh, reading in chapter 9, chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel, and I'll read from um, the first verse there. And he said to them, that's Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where, he, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from de the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. This time of the year, Easter time, is the centre of of our Christian calendar. In fact, in the Old Testament, the Passover was the centre of all of the Jewish thinking. Whenever they went through hassles and problems, they would look back to the time when they were delivered from the land of Egypt, taken through the Red Sea and all the rest of it. They would keep going back to that time and time again. But the new Passover, what we call Easter, supersedes in so many ways what happened in the old. In the old you had the lamb's blood being applied to the door. You had the uh, coming out of Egypt, bringing the bones of uh, Joseph with them as he had asked them to do. You have going through the Red Sea, going into the uh, um, desert, going to Sinai. Fifty days, if we calculate it, after that Passover was the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. When we go over into the New Testament, we see something far greater. We see the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross and giving his life and shedding his blood. We see the going into the place of death and the coming out of the place of death in resurrection as we remember today. We also remember too that 50 days after that Passover wasn't the giving of a new set of laws but was the giving of the Holy Spirit to write mind, God's mind and will on our hearts, on the hearts of the believer. So much difference and so much, so, so much of a, a different uh, way of seeing things when we see this time in the Lord Jesus Christ. In this passage we just read, the passage that we call the uh, Transfiguration, if you look at the verses that came before, and we didn't read them for the sake of time, you'll see that it starts off, there's several things that all happen around the same time. First of all, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they have 
a list of the different people that they think that people are saying that Jesus is. But Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking on behalf of the others, as, as he often did, says, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commends him for saying that, but asks them not to say anything. Why? Because the concept that Peter had, even though he was right in saying that Jesus was the Messiah, the concept that he and the disciples and Judaism at that time had of the Messiah was not the right concept. And so Jesus doesn't want them to go to amplify what they already believe, but he wants them to learn something new. And it goes straight on with Jesus sharing with them exactly what the true Messiah was all about. The true Messiah must suffer, must be handed over, must be crucified, but would rise again. And immediately Peter, seeing the big difference between what Jesus is saying and what they were brought up to believe, turns around and tells Jesus not to do it. You can't do that. Yet this can't happen to you. Yet it's not part of the plan that we, we think is supposed to happen. And, and Jesus goes on and, and explains to him and says that this, the pattern that you're thinking is not the pattern that God's got. In fact, that comes from the other side, from the dark side, the way that you're thinking. And then Jesus goes on and he says things like, you know, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up your cross to follow me. What was he saying? He was saying it's not greatness that is the, the thing to aim for. It's not greatness, but it's being the lamb because the lamb was the lamb of sacrifice. And Jesus was going to be the lamb, the lamb of sacrifice. As John the Baptist had said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as we see in Revelations, as we've noted before, where it's only once where in chapter 5 it says that Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the only time in Scripture, but in then when John looks, what does he see? Not a lion, not a powerful figure that the earth would like, but he sees a lamb that had been slain. And all the way through Revelation, 27 times, it's the lamb, the lamb, the lamb. You see, the lamb wins. The lamb wins. And so Jesus is saying the concept of the Messiah was different from the concept they had. They, the nation of Israel wanted a Barabbas. They didn't want a Jesus. They wanted some powerful figure to come and liberate them and make them world rulers. But that wasn't what God's plan was. Jesus said before Pilate, if my kingdom was of this world, my people would fight. And exactly that's what the church has often gone and done, sponsored the fighting. But Jesus' kingdom was a kingdom for the whole world, a kingdom that is birthed within the person who believes in him. And uh, Jesus explained this thing through. Now, the concept of being a lamb is something that grates with us because we want power. The world wants power. It wants to look powerful, right? You ever heard of a guy called Pervez Masia? Probably not. He lived in Pakistan. He lived and worked in Islamabad. He was a Christian, Pakistani, and he found it very, very hard to, to live. As a Christian in Pakistan, he was constantly put down. He was constantly persecuted, constantly criticised. In fact, he worked in the university as a day worker. He couldn't get full-time work because they wouldn't let Christians have full-time work. He had work each day to go and sign in each day. There were two Taliban terrorists with their bombs strapped on that attacked the university in October 2009. They went, one of them went to the women's, women's area 
of the university where there were 400 student women having their lunch, their cafeteria. His intent was to go in there and blow up all these women who shouldn't have been being educated anyway and uh, so forth. But he was met at the door by another guy who was shot by the terrorist. But the Christian guy, Pervez Masia, worked in that area and he saw what was going to happen. He could have thought, well, these people don't want me, they don't care about me, I'm just dirt to them. He could have gone and just decided to get out and save his own life, but he went, he tackled the terrorist at the doorway, the terrorist detonated the bomb and blew himself and Perez and three other people, students up, but all the other girls were rescued, they were saved. And the people who employed him said that he always was a quiet person, very quiet, went about his work, always did it diligently and everything like that. But you see, if a person had come and preached there on the campus, they probably would have been laughed at. If he'd gone and preached on the campus, he wouldn't have gone anywhere, but he did the lamb thing. He gave his life, and I tell you what, the impression that that made on those 400 Muslim women in that university was far greater than someone standing there and spruiking a message because he became lamb-like. Jesus said this. He said, if you want to follow me, the pattern for the Messiah is to be a lamb because by being the lamb, Jesus won the victory. And then he goes on with this the story of the transfiguration is put in, into the three Gospels. And it goes on because it sort of anchors the thought. But even after this experience, the three disciples, Peter, James and John, that went with him still didn't quite grasp it. And it wasn't until Resurrection Day on the road to Emmaus that they started to realise exactly what had happened. If you remember that part, that story of Emmaus' road to Emmaus, where they talked and said, oh, we thought he was going to do this, he was going to liberate Israel, we thought this was going to... They are all thinking on the old pattern that Israel had. And then Jesus explained to them all the things concerning him from the Old Testament and showed them that Messiah must suffer. That's what Jesus had been talking about with his disciples all the way through. And they didn't, hadn't grasped it. But there on resurrection day, they started to grasp it. But here, they're given an opportunity. And we see the Jesus taking them to a mountain. We're not told which one. It could have been Tamar. It could have been Hermon. We're not told which mountain it was. But it's interesting that when you look at the mountain experiences in the Bible, but we won't get into that. Where he takes these Peter, James and John, they go up to the top of the mountain and there on top of the mountain, Jesus is transfigured. It says he became whiter, his clothes and everything, whiter than anything. It was brilliant. Now what was happening there? It was a picture of that. They should have grasped this. It was a picture like of the Shekinah, Shekinah glory of the Old Testament. Do you know what I mean by that? It used to appear the glory of God in all his fullness and brightness would appear at the tabernacle and particularly on the Ark of the Covenant, that box that was covered in gold made prominent in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, if, if you ever follow those sort of things, right? But that little, little box covered with gold had inside of it the Ten Commandments which the people had broken, all right? And it had a jar of the manna and it had Aaron's bod, uh, rod that budded as well. On the top there was what was called the mercy seat. And on both ends of that were the cherubim with their wings touching, looking down towards the mercy seat. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in there several times and he would put the blood of the offering on the mercy seat. In fact, he would sprinkle blood all the way up to the altar, up to the Ark of the Covenant. So he virtually walked on blood before he got to the Ark of the Covenant and put the blood on the mercy seat. They tell us 
in Jewish um, myths and so forth that the high priest would have a rope tied around his ankle. You see, if he died when he was in there, no one was allowed to go in to get him. So that what they'd do is, if he did die inside there, they'd have to drag him out. But anyway, the high priest did that, which meant that the glory of God was above the mercy seat, but God in all his glory could look at the broken law through the blood on the mercy seat. Right? And that was a picture here on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus comes out in all of that glory of the mercy seat. And what he'd been saying about Messiah must die, it was all there. It was there for the folk, for the disciples to grasp if they only would grasp it. But they didn't grasp it. They didn't take it. It didn't seem to completely fall in. Because as he's there on top of the mountain, there appears beside him Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the old. And it says in Luke, it says that they were talking about what was going to happen to Jesus when he went to Jerusalem, which would have been the doing and dying and, and rising, everything that was going to be happening there that we remember at Easter time. The Friday sadness, the joyfulness of Resurrection Day, the darkness is in the background. We don't have to have black covered Bibles. We can have pink ones. We, can have, we don't have to wear dark clothes and have our jaw bones dragging around our ankles and look like we're sucking on sour plums. We can be joyful and happy. That's what it is. And, uh, and so forth. Anyway, they're there and they're talking over because you see, they and everything in the old was subservient to the one who was there, Jesus. Right? Peter, in, in, in all his uh, muddleness, waking up from a slumbering sleep, seeing the situation, and of course putting the, the whole thing together, tries to join the lot up. Jesus up with the old. Oh, let's have three tabernacles. Let's have the three tents and set it all up, you know, so we've got to think. But, G but the God the Father has a different idea. God the Father blanks the situation out with a cloud and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. You see the focus. And when the cloud went away, it was only Jesus because that's the focus they were to have. And to listen to what he was saying about what was going to happen and what was important. They didn't actually grasp it because they kept on saying, well, what does he mean? Because Jesus said, don't tell anybody about this until after I've been raised from the dead. And they, what does he mean, raised from the dead? They still hadn't grasped, they couldn't grasp it. It wasn't part of, of the plan. You see, what we're brought up with is so strong. What we're told is Bible truth is so strong that often we don't double check things out for ourselves. Right? We don't look at different stuff and, and check it all out for ourselves. We don't check it out. And so it's very hard. And you know, the hardest thing to break through, I often find, is people's religious concepts. You know? I've often chatted with friends who are Muslims and others like that, and I love doing that because having been brought up in Asia. And concepts that people have are the hardest things to break. That's why you're all the time working at building bridges, finding ways that you can build bridges to go across to bring across a concept. If you ever read that story about the peace child from Westerian, and so forth, you get the concept that sometimes people can hear the truth and hear the truth and it just bounces off their tin of worms because, you know, it's everything else they've been learning sort of becomes like a, a, a blocker, a blockage to stop them from understanding until something clicks into place. I often say that with people we're praying for or witnessing to family members you know, we say, oh, we've got to get them to a gospel meeting, but that may not be the answer. They may know more about the gospel than you do, right? Our kids and stuff that go astray. And I know from my own experience of having been a bikey and a hoon and all the rest of it and so forth. 
You see, that often there's something there that needs to come to the surface, and we need to be praying that God will bring to the surface whatever it is that's the blockage so that can be dealt with. In my case, it was a concept of God that I had that somehow I'd picked up that God was an angry God with a big kuchi, as we used to say in India, a big stick looking out for a way to whack me and belt me one, you see? And I didn't realise that until I understood that God has perfectly shown me what he is like in the person of Jesus. Now, if I wanted to know what Jesus, what God was like, take a, take a long, hard, focused look at Jesus. And that's how you find out what God is like. It's interesting when we read through this and find this out because the Lord Jesus came to be different. I used to have a... I used to give away a book. A guy called Phil Belitho, uh, some of you might know him, he used to live in North Queensland, yep. Phil and I worked a lot together. He's still alive. He's 94. He's still going. He, he's, I can't do a great deal, but... Uh, Phil and I did a, we went around about 200 schools, state schools in North Queensland, Central Queensland, some years back doing a, a thing with country gospel music and, and gimmicks and so forth, explaining the gospel, combined church groups in, in the school. We'd have the whole school in different sections. And uh, a book we used to give away at the end, we'd say, if you want to know more about the claims of Jesus on your life, we'd like to send you this book, but you need to get your parents to sign this letter and send it back. That way we were covered, the headmaster was covered and everybody was covered. And the little book was the Scripture Union book, a study on the Gospel of Mark for kids called This Man Was Different. Have you ever seen it? I don't know if it's even still in print, but we used a lot of it. Because you see, Jesus was different, not just different from the -the run-of-the-mill people around, he was different from the religious people. And one of the things I often say based on that idea, when I get, went into the pub at the Lions Den up near Cooktown, and I said to the guys, hey guys, we're going to do a program with some music and stuff, and I want to t- talk about why Jesus wasn't religious. Oh yeah, so they brought their stubby coolers inside, they all sat around and we told them that Jesus was God become man, but he was totally different. He was not religious in the sense that people see people as being religious, he was different. He was different. He reached out to people who were down. He went to the cross for people who didn't want him. He was different. But we've got to remember this, that that's not the end of the story, is it? Today we remember resurrection. Today we remember that, and in baptism, that's, we've got it. It's there, but we often live in the place of death. We live in the place of death all the time so that we become morbid Christians. Our services sound like funerals. We wonder why people don't want to come because people don't come, they only come kicking and screaming to a funeral. You know? But if you're having a party, everyone wants to gate crash it. People don't gate crash funerals, they gate crash parties. And so we live in resurrection. We're put under the water to identify with the death of Jesus on our behalf on the cross. We are raised to identify with his resurrected life and we're to live with that life. And people don't see us because we have a system of theology. They don't see that. That's not the prime thing. They should see us as people who have a deep-seated joy in spite of the times when there are sufferings going on around us and the world's down, going down the gurgler, that we see that, see that there is a joy, a basic joy in spite of the problems that are around. That's what marks the Christian as different. And the lamb-likeness, the preparedness to serve and to be what Jesus himself was to people around us. I love that sign you got out there, you know, offering food parcels to people. I tell you what, that probably does more good than some of the other things which are meaningful, very meaningful to us but not to the person out there who hasn't got a clue. The wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life. Very true. But the point is a lot of people don't know what it is. Right? We presume it, but they don't. The only thing, and I might have mentioned it once before, that I remember that it stuck with me was a sign down at Bethania on a Lutheran guy who had a a panel beating 
engineering workshops. And the sign on the wall he said it had is your car is not the only thing that can be recalled by its maker. And I thought, well, that's good. There are things that we can say that actually do make people think, right? But a lot of the other things we have, they're meaningful to us and they're meaningful if we're trying to catch other Christians to get, get them in, but they not, often are not meaningful because people don't know the background to the people out there. Be joyful, okay? If people see that, they want to gate crash your church. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you that Jesus is alive. We thank you that we have a, a risen, living Saviour, not a dead one to remember. And we just thank you and praise you and ask that in the light of his resurrection we might live and might show people, as Paul said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen.